Well, if you have been coming for any amount of time, you probably know by now I am not Pastor Kevin. I'm not the senior pastor of the church. If you're new here, I am clearly not Pastor Kevin. Uh, my hair isn't quite that gray yet. Um, <laughs> sorry, Pastor Kevin. Uh, <laughs> But um, I am the new student pastor here at the church. And I say new student pastor because uh, I've only been here less than a year. I've talked with people, and, and I was talking with someone just the other week, and they said, Pastor Joe, it seems like you've been here for like three years now. And I had to remind them, I I've actually not even hit my one-year anniversary yet. Um, but I guess that's just what COVID does, is it makes time seem to stretch out, makes it feel like things are taking forever. Um, but since I am the, the new student pastor here, I thought it would be good for us to get to know each other. Now, obviously, we can't have an open dialogue in a setting like this. You can find me outside after the service and come stop by and say hello or tell me how awful the sermon was, whatever it is that suits your fancy. Um, but I'll be out there. Uh, but before that, I thought I would let you know some things about me. Um, I am uh, 30 years old. I am a former college wrestler. I wrestled for Liberty University. I uh, was a Division I wrestler, national qualifier, um, and those are good things. But uh, right after college, I actually didn't start out going into ministry. I started off as a government contractor, and the Lord had other plans for me and brought me into student ministry. Um, and I was actually a little bit concerned about that, working with stinky hormonal teenagers. I wasn't sure about that, but, but God had plans for me, and I have been blessed ever since. Um, since I started in ministry, I actually met my beautiful wife, Laura, who's here with us this morning, and um, together we have two little boys, Alistair and Isaiah. They are ages three and two, and before you ask, yes, we are crazy. They're 14 months apart, and yes, please pray for us, um, because having two little tornadoes running around the house, it gets very busy in the household. Um, because I have little kids, this holiday season has been very fresh for me. You know, normally when you're a kid and you're growing up, you anticipate Christmas, you anticipate the holidays, and the older you get, maybe it kind of wears off. Um, but having two little guys has really just kind of we reawakened uh, an excitement for Christmas time to me. Alistair in particular, because he's three years old, he's excited about Christmas. He's starting to have a concept and understanding that something special is happening. He sees the tree go up and the presents, and he knows we're going to go see Nona and Papa or, or Nana and Bebop. That's my parents or Lara's parents. And, and it's an exciting time, but it has also made my life much busier. You see, before I could get away with like, you know, some, some cheap little toys and stuff. Now I've actually got to step it up and I've got to get good gifts, you know. I've got to spend a little bit extra money. I've got to search around a little bit more. Uh, you know, we got to go and visit family now that we're living a few hours away. Life has gotten a lot busier. A anyone else here feel like over the last four weeks life has just been busy? Anyone here feel like life has just been busy the last four weeks? Between all of the, the shopping Right, the, the shopping, the planning, the meal preparations, the, the hosting, the visiting, all of that. And then you add on another layer, right, that we are in a pandemic still. And, and there's this worry about potentially catching and spreading a virus to family and to friends. This season has been busy and stressful. And so that's what I want us to talk about today. I want us to talk about busyness. As we wrap up this series uh, called The Colors of Christmas, and we think about the color silver, silver kind of represents busyness because I don't know about you, when I drive by, I don't even notice all the silver things around me. E even this pulpit, right, is silver, and we so often miss it because we're in a rush for whatever the next thing is that we have to get to. So as we consider silver, I want us to consider busyness. And I want us to think about what Jesus wants for us instead of busyness. If you have your Bible, would you open up to Luke chapter 10? We're going to be a little bit past the Christmas story. Jesus has grown up now. But here we're going to see an example in Scripture that I think will help us to understand what the Lord desires for us. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed her into her house. When she, uh, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much 
serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And so here we're introduced to two women, right? You've got Martha and you've got Mary. And now if you've ever read this passage of scripture before, or maybe you've heard someone preach from this passage of scripture, poor Martha gets dragged through the mud, right? I mean, she just gets dragged through the mud, ran over with a bus, and then backed up and hit again. And I, poor Martha just gets, just gets rammed with this. Because we read this and we think, Martha, are you kidding me? Come on, you've got Jesus here with you, the Messiah, the Savior, God's anointed one. Surely the tea and the lunch can wait, right? Are you so busy that you have to miss what's going on right in front of you? And yes, so often we read scripture like this, we read this particular passage, and we like to think of ourselves as Mary, right? We want to picture ourselves as, as Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet, soaking up his teaching, and annoyed with all of the, the nagging Marthas in the world, trying to get us to, to be busy with other things. But if we consider our own hearts, if we consider our, our own lives, just even over the last four weeks, I think that we'll realize that we are more like Martha than we might normally care to admit. Because you see, Martha was busy. She was busy doing things, though, that were culturally appropriate. In Middle Eastern culture, when you had a guest come into your home, uh, it, it was culturally appropriate, and it actually still is culturally appropriate and customary to prepare a meal for all of the people who came to gather and, and be with you. You would prepare food, you would prepare drinks, and in ancient Jewish, Jewish cultures, um, it was dictated that the guest held a position of honor in the home. In fact, the guest was supposed to be treated as though they were a king coming to visit, and the, the owner of the house was to treat themselves as a servant to serve their guest. One example in scripture that I think will really help us to understand how socially important hosting was, we should turn to Genesis chapter 19. So if you have your Bible, put your finger there and turn over to Genesis chapter 19. And here we're going to see a story uh, about Lot, right? Maybe you've heard this story about Lot. He lives in, in the town of Sodom, the city of Sodom. And two angels visited Lot and his wife and his daughters and while they were staying with the Lord, the men, uh, the, while they were staying with the, the Lord of the house, right, Lot, they, the men in the city gathered around Lot's house and they tried to beat the doors down because they wanted to commit these sexual atrocities against Lot's visitors. And so Lot, like a good host, like I think any of us would do, tries to stop that, right? It, it's, it's good to protect the people who come into your house. But look how far Lot is willing to go. Genesis chapter 19 Starting in verse 7, he says, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. As a father, my heart hurts as I read that. Mothers, fathers in this room here uh, joining us online, you, you read that and you think, are you serious? You would be willing to throw your own daughters to the mob in order to protect your guests? Let me just ask, do you think hosting was a big deal in that culture? That he would be willing to go that far? Absolutely. Hosting is a big deal in this culture. And I think that helps us understand the gravity of it. So now that we've had that little horrific kind of detour into Genesis, uh, let's turn back over to Luke, and we'll continue to see about Mary and Martha. Because Martha takes her responsibilities seriously. 
She's very serious about hosting. She was busy trying to serve Jesus and his disciples. Think about it. You've got 13 grown men who just traveled on foot to come into your town. They're probably hungry. They're probably thirsty. And as a host, it's your job to serve them. And all the while, Mary ignores the societal customs of her day. Martha's busying herself. She is busying herself with the things that we would say are good things. If we were living in Martha's day, we would look at that and say, you're busy with all of the right things. You're busy with the things that a host should busy themselves with. Her stress, her anxiety, those were justified. The the stress and anxiety she had was justified because of the cultural demands, the cultural duty that she had to be a good host. Just like how we, in today's society, Give ourselves an excuse for stressing out over the busyness of the holidays. We give ourselves a pass to let our anxieties go through the roof during this season, all because of the busyness that is demanded of us. And that's exactly what's produced in our lives, understand. When we allow ourselves to to let busyness into our lives, when we allow ourselves to be overly busy, stress and anxiety take root in our lives. There's your first fill in the blank there is that stress and anxiety take root in our lives. And we see this happening in the story before us. We see the stress and anxiety taking root in Martha's life. And Jesus saw the stress and the anxiety in her life as well. And and look at how he responds to her. In verse 41, he says, He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. He he sees that she's worried about so many things, about all the hosting and the preps and, and, and all of the cultural demands that are on her to be a good host. She is stressed. Jesus saw the stress and the anxiety taking root in her life because of her busyness. And so Jesus decides to help her. Now, it wasn't in the way that Martha asked. Right? And it probably wasn't the way that we might have expected Jesus to help. Instead of telling Mary, hey, get up and, and go help your sister, or instead of rolling up his own sleeves and, and helping Martha out himself, Jesus decides to speak truth into the situation. He helps by speaking truth into Martha's life. Because Jesus doesn't want us, doesn't want her to become so busy that she missed the point of things, just like this holiday season. Just like this holiday season, we can become so focused on the gifts and, and, and the, the presents and the this and the that, all of the preparations and the hosting and the visiting, everything that goes into this, and we can become so focused on these things that we miss the point of it all. You know, we talk about the, the reason for the season, and all of the busyness that the world continually throws at us tries to distract us and redirect our focus so that way we miss the point of it all. And we grow up thinking that Christmas time is about presents and about fat men in red suits and visiting family. And, and don't get me wrong, visiting family is good. Presents are, are a fine thing. Preparing meals and hosting, these are all, these are fine things in and of themselves. But I can confidently say that Jesus would not want this unnecessary busyness for us. That's your next fill in the blank there, that Jesus would not want this unnecessary busyness for us. Instead, instead, he would rather we fix our eyes on him. And I feel confident enough to say that because of how he responds to Martha. Look at in verse 42. Or we'll start in verse 41 again. He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Martha was worried about so many things, about all the things that that had to happen for her to be considered a good host. Just like how we can become so busy and distracted with everything that happens during the holiday seasons. And so we need the reminder that Jesus gives to Martha that there is only one thing that is important, and it's not presents, 
It's not visiting family. It's not making a good dish. It's not being the, the best cook in the family. It's not having special memories for your kids. The one thing that matters is Jesus. Only one thing matters this season, and it's Jesus. And this is because Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our King. Just as it says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says that he is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. And when we take the time to slow down and to strip away all of the unnecessary busyness, and we instead fix our eyes on Jesus, we will be able to truly have peace. And isn't that what we want in our lives? I don't know anybody that says, you know what, I want more busyness. I want more distraction. Peace, I don't want any of that. Everybody wants more peace. And Jesus brings peace to those who look to him. If you have your Bible, flip on over to John chapter 14, verse 27. He says, John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, by slowing down and, and, and coming to Jesus, we can begin to receive the peace that he's offering to us. The peace that we so desperately need in our lives. And so with the rest of the time that we have this morning, I, I want us to focus in on some application how do we get this peace? If Jesus is offering it to us, how do I receive his peace? Well, the first thing that I want us to understand, and you're filling the blank here, is that peace is not passively received. Peace is not passively received. It's not like when, you know, my kids decide that they want to go on a rampage and open up the paint and try painting the walls for me. Or, you know, they decide that they want to chase the dog around with a pair of scissors that I say, oh, you know what, this is stressful. I'm going to go take a nap. No, 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 that's not how that works. Right? I've got a new puppy in the house, and he's not fully potty trained yet. And so, you know, he makes a lot of little messes, and it's, it's a little bit stressful. And, and it's not like that happens, and I say, yeah, you know, I'm going to go for a walk by myself right now. Peace is not passively received. You see, over and over in Scripture, we are actually told to pursue peace. We are told to pursue peace, not wait around for it. Over in Psalm, uh, in Psalm 34, verse 14, it, it talks about this so clearly. Psalm 34, 14 says, Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace. And pursue it. Seek. Pursue. These are verbs, right? These require us to do something. These require action and movement on our part in order to have peace. And so Jesus wants us to have peace. And if we want to receive the peace that he is offering to us, we have to be willing to pursue it. Now, you might be thinking, hold on a second, Pastor Joel. I thought you just told me that busyness is bad. Right, that we need to be less busy. And now you're telling me I have to do something? And now you're telling me that I have to be busier? Well, well, which is it? Is it be busy or be less busy? Let me just say this, and this is your fill in the blank here. Being busy is not bad if we are busy for the right reasons. Being busy is not bad if we're busy for the right reasons. We can be busy for all the right reasons and have the peace of God in our lives, or we can be busy for all of the wrong reasons and have stress and anxiety take root in our hearts. And so rather than focusing on the cultural and the societal demands of the holiday season, focus instead on Christ. Focus on Christ and the peace that he offers us. And so in order to pursue and receive this peace, we must stop. And yes, STOP is an acronym. Uh, I know Pastor Kevin loves acronyms, and so I just knew. I was like, you know, Pastor Kevin's given me this opportunity to, to deliver God's word this morning. I've got to fit an acronym in for him. So, Pastor Kevin, there you go. Uh, we need to stop in order to receive God's peace. S, we need to set 
our minds on God. Set your mind on God. Over in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 6, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and, don't miss this, peace. To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And so this is the first and most important thing that we must do. Just as Mary set her mind and her attention on Jesus sitting at his feet, so we must also set our mind and our attention on Jesus if we wish to receive his peace into our lives. And we do this by intentionally slowing down. Just as Mary intentionally slowed down and ignored the the cultural demands on her to focus on Jesus, that's what we have to do. We have to slow down in order to create space and time to set our minds on God. See, the Lord said in, in Psalm 46, verse 10, he said, Be still and know that I am God. We must be still. We have to be still before we can truly set our mind on God and know that he is God. If we don't do that, we run the risk of unintentionally believing that we are in fact God. If not in our words, at least in our actions, by allowing ourselves to be busy and focusing on number one instead of him. So we have to set our mind on God. T, talk things out with others. We've got to talk things out with other people. In Matthew uh, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, during the Beatitudes, Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And so if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember there that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. You see, it isn't enough for us to just focus on God. We have to be intentional. We have to make it our business to reconcile with other people in our lives. You might remember the passage where where a Pharisee tried to trip Jesus up and said, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What's the top commandment? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. And then Jesus throws in a bonus. He says the second is just like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. You see, it is so important, it is so crucial to God that we love other people, that we reconcile with people in our lives that we might have disagreements with, that he says that we shouldn't give a gift to God until we've done so. Now, this isn't to say that giving gifts is wrong or that we shouldn't do these things, that we shouldn't be obedient with our finances in this way, but what it is saying is that our relationships with others are of primary importance when compared to the gifts and the offerings and the tithes that we give to the Lord. We should be obedient in these ways, but our relationships take priority. And so if we want to be near to God, if we want to be close to God and and have his peace and receive it, we have to be willing to talk things out with others. That's T. O. Set your mind on God, right? S. T. Talk things out with others. O. Obey God's commands. Obey God's commands. In Psalm 119, verse 165, it says, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Great peace have those who love your law. If we love the law of God, if we love the word of God, we would be obedient to his commands. We would obey God's commands. And you see, obedience to God's commands brings peace into our lives. It says, great peace have those who love your law. But conversely, disobedience brings chaos into our lives. You know, there was a former student of mine 
uh, who loved Jesus. And she loved God. And, and I remember she came to me one day and she said, Pastor Joe, I, I've, I'm really struggling it seems like nothing is going right in my life. And every time I, I, I sit down to pray, it feels like I'm just talking to an empty room. You ever been there? I have. She said, it feels like my prayers aren't going any higher than the ceiling. And it seems like everything in my life is just constantly in chaos. Like nothing seems to be going my way. And as I talked with her, I realized there is one common root to all of this. She had disobedience in her life. She was living in unrepentant sin. She was holding on to an area of her life that was in rebellion against the holy God of the universe, against her heavenly Father. And all of her issues could have been resolved by simply obeying Christ. Now, I know I say simply obeying Christ as though, you know, sin and temptation weren't a thing, as though the devil wasn't a powerful enemy. But we've been given the Spirit of God, a spirit to obey, a spirit of power to do the will of the Father. And so we must, we must be obedient to God's commands. If we withhold obedience to God, then his peace is withheld from us. If we are disobedient to God, then we should not expect to receive his peace in our lives. And so after we fix our eyes on God, and after we reconcile with the people in our lives, we have to obey the commands that God has given to us, the things that we know he has called us to do. Oh, obey God's commands. And our final application point here is to P, pray with thanksgiving. We have to pray with thanksgiving. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, do not be anxious about anything. Boy, that's hard during this time of year. <laughs> do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, when life seems busy, and when the demands on our lives are overwhelming, we have to turn to the Lord in prayer. And what I love about this verse is it doesn't just say to pray to God. It tells us how we should pray to God. It says pray with thanksgiving. See, when we start the, the, the stop process here and we set our minds on God, it moves us to a place of thanksgiving. Because we will begin to realize just how blessed we are. We begin to see the ways that God has shown his mercy and his grace in our lives, even despite all the anxieties that we might feel because of our busyness. And so when we come to God, we come with, to him with prayers of thanksgiving on our lips because we recognize his power and his sovereignty and his goodness and his mercy and his righteousness in our lives and it is precisely because of his power and his sovereignty and his goodness and his righteousness that we can trust him with our worries and we can release those things to him. When we look to God, we are reminded of his character and it causes us to be thankful to him. And when we do this, just as verse 7 states, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding all human comprehension will guard our hearts and our minds. Man, I would love that. Wouldn't that be nice to have the peace of God to guard your heart and your mind? And so as we come to the holiday season, as we, we, we move through Christmas and, thanks and, and, and New Year's, and we consider the busyness that surrounds us, let us take time to stop. Let us take time to set our minds on God, to talk things out with others, to obey the commands of God, and to pray with thanksgiving. While the world seeks to distract us and get us off target with all of the, the good things uh, that, that come with the holiday seasons, let's focus on the one thing that truly matters. The one thing that Jesus said was necessary. In a time where it's easier to be a Martha, 
let's resolve to be a Mary. And so if you're here, and, and, and your life is in chaos, maybe you're really feeling the stress and the busyness of this holiday season, I want to invite you to pursue the peace of God, to take that first step, to consider stop, and, and, and set your mind on God. Maybe you're here this holiday season because in conjunction with all the craziness of the pandemic, you're feeling like life is out of control. Maybe uh, you, your life feels like it's a mess. Maybe your priorities are out of line. Or maybe you're just so busy that life seems to be passing you by. And you just want to find a way to stop the train. I want to invite you this morning to turn to God, to take the first step by getting to know Jesus. You see, Jesus offers his peace to those who look to him. And so if, if you've never turned towards Christ and, and you've never set your mind on God, then I want to invite you to hear him calling out to you this morning. Hear the word of God calling out to you. Jesus said in, in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, he said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They hear my voice. They know my voice. They follow me. He said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. And then Jesus makes this bold proclamation, I and the Father are one. And so if you're here this morning, and you're hearing Jesus call to you, calling out to turn to him, then I invite you right now to respond to Jesus, to turn towards Christ, and to follow him, because in him is eternal life that is secure. In Jesus is eternal life that cannot be taken away. In Jesus is peace, the peace that comes with being reconciled to the holy God, the creator of the universe, the heavenly father who sent his son to die on a cross, to bleed for your sins and for my sins. You see, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus came to pay the penalty. The little baby that we just celebrated two days ago, being born into this world, came for one mission only, to die on a cross 30 years later. And to pay the penalty for your sin and for my sin, so that way we can have the peace of God. If you're hearing him calling out to you, offering you his peace and his forgiveness, would you pray with me now to repent of your sin and believe in him. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace that comes into our lives as we look to you. Lord, with all of the busyness that happens during this holiday season, it's, it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to, to rush past the true reason for the season. And God, as we prepare to launch into the new year, would you set it in our hearts and in our minds to be resolved to look to you, to set it in our hearts and our minds to turn towards you, to stop, to set our mind on God, to talk things out with others, to obey your commands, and to pray to you with thanksgiving, because Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. God, I just ask that if there's anyone here who has not turned to you, who has not set their mind on you, that you would put it on their heart right now. And maybe, maybe that's you here this morning. Would you pray something similar to this? The, the words I'm saying aren't magical. The words I'm, I'm saying aren't, aren't some incantation. But just in the stillness of your own heart, as you slow down, say something like this. Just, God, I am so sorry for the ways that I have busied myself with things that are not honoring to you, with things that, that take away my focus from you. God, I'm sorry for the sin that I've allowed into my life that has kept me at odds with you. Lord, I give that to you now. I recognize that you came and you died on a cross. You were buried in the grave and then you victoriously conquered death and ascended to the right hand of the Father. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin 
and make me new. If you're here and you prayed something like that, I want to pray a blessing over you. God, would you work in the lives of, of anyone here who has prayed a prayer similar to that, that has chosen this morning to embrace you as their Savior, to recognize you as the Lord that you are. And God, would you do a work in them to move them, help our church to come alongside them, to disciple them, so that way they can grow to full maturity in Christ. And God, would you be glorified in their lives. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. We praise you and thank you.